football. I've been watching it for 40 years. Are you kidding me? You're listening to Winning Cures Everything. Game day, baby. Wake up or get out. Here's your host. A confident young man. A superb athlete. Gary Seegers. Welcome in, Winning Cures Everything. It is the Thursday, September 8th edition of the show. I am your host, Gary Seegers. You can follow me on Twitter at GaryWCE. We have a lot to get to in a very short amount of time, so we're going to go ahead and dive in. First things first, thank you to everybody who has subscribed to the BetUS College Football Show. We have hit 6,000 subscribers. We are shooting for seven next, and then eight, and then nine, and then ten. So go ahead and subscribe if you have not already while you're at it. Since you're watching this show anyway, go ahead and subscribe to the Winning Cures Everything show on YouTube or on your favorite podcast app, whether that be Apple, Spotify, Amazon Music, TuneIn, Stitcher, whatever it is, Overcast, all the Podcast Addict, all of these. Hit that subscribe button. Make sure that you are getting the latest episodes. We, of course, do this every Sunday, Tuesday, and Thursday. So you can go back and watch it on Monday, Wednesday, Friday if you would like to. But, uh, but we knock them out on Sunday, Tuesday, and Thursday. I know I said at the beginning of the season that I was going to put the podcast out on Monday, Wednesday, Friday. Instead, what I'm doing is just as soon as I get these things recorded, I am putting them out. Of course, the Sunday show is live. It is a live reaction. So make sure that you join us after week two, Sunday morning at 1030 a.m. Eastern time to go over all of the different things that are going on in the world of college football and react to the games that have happened on Saturday afternoon and on Friday evening as well. All right. Ah, let's go ahead and get into this. Uh, oh, by the way, the show, powered by BetUS. It is where the game begins. It's America's premier online sports book. There's a link in the description. You can go check it out. You can also watch me do several things over at BetUS TV. I was on Three Dog Thursday the past two weeks. Uh, of course, this show is coming out after Three Dog Thursday came out. But regardless, you can go back and watch my three picks. I did go 3-0 and on Three Dog Thursday last week, picking three underdogs against the spread. Did the same thing for today's show over at BetUS TV. You can find links to that in the description as well. So go ahead and check it out. But the show brought to you by BetUS. It is powered by BetUS, and it will continue to be all season long. We certainly appreciate them for helping us out. All right. Now let's go ahead and get into this. Uh, the first thing that I want to get into, Pat McAfee. Pat McAfee show. That's right. You guys know how much I love him. Uh, Pat McAfee is going full-time. With College Game Day, Andrew Marchand over at the New York Post is the one that actually uh, released this news, and then McAfee confirmed it afterwards, uh, but he released it at like 11 p.m. On, uh, on the 6th, so a couple of days ago, Tuesday evening. It says he will be a full-time member of ESPN's College Game Day. The former punter-turned-multimedia performer will be on the show this Saturday from Austin, where number one Alabama will face Texas. So, it, basically... This is a fantastic, fantastic idea from ESPN. When Pat McAfee was on a few years ago on College Game Day, that show was absolutely electric. It was bonkers. Everything, he was must-see TV. There is nobody on game day right now that is must-see TV. Now, you guys know how much I love the Bear. You guys know how much I love Lee Corso. But Lee Corso's 87 years old. There are problems on that set. You have got to find somebody that can engage with that crowd. They brought in Jack Harlow, who's uh, apparently a rapper. I, I didn't know much about him, but he's in, he seemed pretty likable to me. But he didn't know a thing about college football. And Pat McAfee at least played college football and knows college football. He, he is insanely entertaining. So this is a absolute bombshell. This is fantastic because Big Noon Kick was getting ready to start this weekend for Fox. This makes you want to watch ESPN. Now, I will tell you this. This contract had to be gargantuan for Pat McAfee to give up doing SmackDown on Friday nights. Like, he he did say in his show that he talked to the WWE because he just signed a, a contract extension with them just a few months ago. Like, two more years or whatever it is. It was a pretty big deal. He is giving up SmackDown. Now, WWE told him it's not good for your health for you to be doing overnight flights from SmackDown over to wherever, and he's going to have to be on set at like 5 a.m., wherever these places are, 5 a.m. Eastern time, I think, or, or 6 or somewhere around there, uh, in order to get ready for the show. 
So, yeah, that was going to be quite a hassle. And I, I did, when I shared this out on Twitter, I did explain this is bananas. Like, his schedule is nuts. But he's always done this. Like, he, he does whatever he can to build his radio show, which, by the way, uh, FanDuel did a deal with him four years and pays a, in excess of $120 million over four years. So $30 million a year for his show to advertise FanDuel. That's insane. That's awesome. But, yeah, props to him. Uh, everything he did on that show was awesome. Him jumping in the lake. Uh, when he first came on as a guest to uh, for the for the Jackrabbits for South Dakota State, like all of it, um, and he's still doing the uh, the Omaha Productions thing where he's gonna uh, multicast with the Mannings or with with Peyton, I guess, uh, six college football games this year. So he's gonna do game day, and then he's gonna go somewhere, and he's going to talk about whatever game is gonna be on ABC or ESPN. Like, I mean, it just continues. And then he's going to have to keep up with Sunday NFL so that he can talk about it on a show on Monday through Friday. So it's, yeah, this is this is bonkers. But cheers to him because I think it is a fantastic move from college game day. All right, that takes us over to Dabo Sweeney. The Clemson head coach has a new contract. That is correct. You heard me correctly. Even after a disappointing season last year, he does get a new 10-year, $115 million contract. And the funny part about it to me, at one, it's, it, this puts him right behind Nick Saban again. So Kirby Smart won a national championship. He was boosted up to be the, the highest uh, paid college football coach. And then after that, Nick Saban got a boost to be the highest paid college football coach. And now Dabo Sweeney of course, gets boosted up to be the second highest paid college football coach right behind Nick Saban, right above Kirby Smart. So Kirby is just out here getting everybody paid. He is doing the damn thing, and cheers to him for that. Uh, Grace Rayner, of course, covers at Clemson over at The Athletic, said Davos Sweeney received a new contract that runs through 2031. He'll make $10.5 million in 2022 and will incrementally work his way up to $12.5 million at the end of the contract. And here's the funny part. His buyout for the Alabama job remains one and a half times higher than the buyout for any other school. Athletic departments, ADs, presidents, if you are worried about your coach leaving you, get this put in there. Whatever school you're scared of, go ahead and do your extension, etc. You know, James Franklin, Mel Tucker, all these different ones that have gotten these gargantuan contracts, go ahead and put in there the schools that you are worried about them leaving you for and then make the buyout that much higher. It's like, hey, if you want to leave me to go to Maryland, then okay, that's fine. You know what? We'll even take the buyout down if you do that. But if you want to leave for one of these bigger schools, for example, for Penn State last year, it would have been USC, uh, put USC in the contract. I mean, my gosh, like how hard is this? I, I feel like I feel like people overthink these things. You don't have to pay them that much more money. Give them a little bit of a bump, especially if their performance on the field does not indicate that they need one, <laughs> James Franklin. Uh, but after that, yeah, like I just toss the school in there. Like make it where they have to pay you if they want the coach. This seems simple, right? I, I swear to God. I, uh, it's so it's so frustrating. All right, let's let's uh, let's move along. Next one up, uh, congratulations to Dabo Sweeney for that. By the way, that's a massive contract. We will see if he is worth it. I understand that he brought two national championships to Clemson. I know that he's rebuilt that entire program. But was that him or was that the AD? Was that Dan? Just a question. Just a, We'll see about these new coordinators and whatnot. The new offensive staff only has 11, no, 12 years of Power 5 experience, and I think all but one of those is at Clemson. Just saying. Just saying. All right. Big 12. The commissioner, Brett Yormark, had some interesting comments. Justin Williams, of course, who covers Cincinnati uh, for the Athletic, he had some interesting stuff here. Brett Yormark on the early TV window with ESPN and Fox. 
Your mark said, pull up this whole thing. That process has started. I met with ESPN last week, had great meetings with them. I think we're very aligned and very like-minded in where uh, we want to go in the future. I'll be meeting with Fox in the next week to gauge their interest. Obviously, these are conversations to explore if it's in everyone's best interest to go early. Now, we talked about this last week, the idea that Alabama and, excuse me, that Oklahoma and Texas could be leaving the Big 12 early because of all the playoff expansion talk, because of da 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 all these different things that all work uh, synchronously, right? He said, uh, to gain clarity, my gut tells me that both Fox and ESPN would like to do that, but I'll know for sure once I meet with Fox in the next week. Okay, so that's just the beginning. After, this, after these comments, he did this. It says, uh, Big 12 Commission Brett Yormark on potential future expansion and what types of schools would be additive for the Big 12 moving forward. Now we're getting into expansion talk. Big 12 Commission Brett Yormark on potential future conference expansion and what schools would be added to the Big 12. Well, I don't want to get into the specifics, and I appreciate the question, but obviously, going out west is where I would like to go, entering that fourth time zone, a program that has national recognition, one that competes at the highest level in basketball and football, stands for the right things, and is a good cultural fit. Because our alignment right now and the like-mindedness of all of our member institutions is fantastic. It's never been better. So I don't want to compromise that. And that's critically important that there is the right cultural fit when you think about coming in and being part of what we're building here. So he talks about having meetings with ESPN and Fox. And they've already begun those discussions. And then he jumps in here and he goes, I don't want to get into specifics. Obviously, going out west is where I would like to go. And then here's the ticker. Entering that fourth time zone. It says a program that has national recognition. Now, that could be a lot of different places. That could be San Diego State. That could be any of the Pac-12 schools, etc. Who knows? But what I'm getting from this is that he had these discussions with ESPN and Fox, and they said, you know, it'd be really helpful. We could make your deal a little bit sweeter if you had... A school in the Pacific time zone. So the networks are still running this thing. Uh, They're still running realignment. Even though we did have the college football playoff expansion uh, go through, we are still going to see movement because those TV contracts are still worth money. And Brett Yormark has said multiple times that his job is to add value to the conference. And by adding value... That would require that he brings in somebody from the West Coast so they can take advantage of that late-night time slot. I don't think he's going to bring in a lot of schools. I do think he's going to bring somebody. I don't know who it will be. It could be San Diego State. If they get that done before the Pac-12 does, that's interesting because that leaves the Pac-12 in a very, very precarious situation. I want to see what happens. I can't wait. You guys leave it in the comments. Let me know what your thoughts are on this because I... I don't know yet, but I know something's coming. I know something is coming. I don't know what yet, though. All right. Moving on from there, uh, let's hit some some quick stuff. Right quick. Uh, <laughs> Brian Kelly <laughs> started quipping with a, uh, a reporter that, uh, that was late to, <laughs> to a press conference. And you know we'll just play it, and then we'll we'll rehash what actually happened here. But good gracious, uh, this is this is too good. And and now we're uh, excited about the weekend. So, with that, we'll uh, we'll open it up to this late arriving uh, media crowd that uh, must have uh, enjoyed the the weekend. Um, that's usually ten dollars um, that we put in the kitty um, for. We'll, we'll have a big bash at the end of the year. At my place. I don't think it has anything to do with winning. I think it has to do with being on time. All right, here we go. Brian, right here in the middle. So, in case you did not hear that, he, of course, is getting on to somebody for being late to the press conference, which, by the way, uh, we'll explain who this is momentarily, but Brian Kelly started the press conference early. He started, apparently, he got to the podium like six minutes before the scheduled time, which is very interesting. Uh, but he says that. He he makes a couple of jabs. You know, it's $10 if you're late to the press conference. 
Well, the reporter decides to jive back with maybe I'll be on time or maybe if you win, I'll be on time. How awesome is that? And the reporter that did that was Leah Van. She said, press conference was at noon. I was running from a doctor's appointment, got there at 11.57. Brian Kelly called me out, said jokingly I owed him $10. I said if he won, maybe I'd be on time. Not my finest hour. I apologized. He was super chill and said I still owe him $10. Now, she also said, I know Brian Kelly likes to joke. He clearly took it as one from our conversation afterward, all in good fun. And then he said he needs, uh, he said he needs $10 so he can afford his new jackets. And I said he has $90 million for that. He said that's a smoke screen. And I said that's fair. And I liked his new jacket. And he thanked me. So that's the details from this. But I will tell you, uh, yes, I can understand joking and whatnot. But when you see somebody that makes a joke and then somebody immediately flashes right back at them and they don't know what to do, that's what Brian Kelly did in this match. He froze for just a second. He, he did not expect a comeback. But if you don't win at LSU... You're going to get that kind of stuff. Just saying. I remember listening to Bobby Bear back in the day. I remember how these things went. Anybody that listened to Bobby Bear on WWL, if you listen to Bear after, uh, and that's T-Bob's dad, by the way, but if you listen to Bobby Bear ask questions to Les Miles after that 2011 National Championship game, <laughs> they will get on you. I'm telling you. So Brian Kelly... Uh, it might be in your best interest to uh, whoop up on Southern this week and then take care of business against Mississippi State next week. Moving on, another interesting topic here. The Alabama Million Dollar Band will not be attending the game at Texas this weekend, and it's not a huge ordeal. This has happened before. Uh, as a matter of fact, if you remember, this happened with LSU back in 2019 when they made the trip to Austin as well. Daryl K. Royal Stadium, uh, Memorial Stadium, excuse me, uh, their band did not make the trip. And the reason behind that is this. It says, due to the seating location and configuration of the visiting institution's ticket allotment at Daryl K. Royal Texas Memorial Stadium, the Million Dollar Band will not make the trip this weekend for the Alabama at Texas football game. Now, the reason being, they have put the visitors section in the upper level. And trying to get up there with all those instruments, etc., not to mention the fact that the Million Dollar Band wears these gigantic uniforms that are pretty hot, especially when it is insanely warm outside. Uh, it's supposed to be 95 degrees at kickoff in Austin on Saturday morning. It's supposed to be hot. Now, this seems ridiculous, but uh, CDC, Chris Del Conte, uh, the AD at Texas said this. He said, we moved the visitor section from the lower bowl to give our students a contiguous student section, thus creating a fantastic atmosphere for NDKR. If a visiting team elects to bring their band, they must sit in the seats allotted for visitors. Seems petty. Seems ridiculous. Whatever. <laughs> I don't think it's going to affect the game one way or the other, uh, but when you do this kind of thing, you are at least fueling a little more of the fire from the opponent. Uh, I don't know that you'll really notice. I do know that you're you're not going to hear the Alabama fight song. Uh, you did not hear the LSU fight. You didn't hear Hold That Tiger. Yeah, we'll see. I mean, maybe this is a... I, what I fear is that other ADs are going to do this. And it will continue on. I'm hopeful it won't. Um, but, uh, you know, I've seen visitors, I've seen band members in Upper Decks before. So, this is not the end of the world. It is what it is. Regardless, here you go. All right. Coach O. Let's talk about Coach O. He was at the Little Rock Touchdown Club earlier this week. And he was asked multiple questions about his, uh, his time at LSU, his exit from LSU. And this story was absolutely hilarious to me. So, of course, I had to toss it out here. Uh, I'll let you guys hear it, and then, and then we'll comment a little bit. It's less than a minute. I'm so grateful of my time for LSU. That was my opportunity. You know, coaches got a shelf. Some coaches got 50 years. Some coaches got 12. Mine was six. Good. I got to tell you, we had a meeting. They coach, things are not going well. No shit. Ray Charles can see that, brother. (laughs) (laughs) 
and they were good. And, and Scott Woodward is a friend of mine that I really, really, a lot of respect for the way they handled me. So and what's thought, next? Well, well I got to tell, tell you this, though. <laughs> Say, Coach, you got $17.1 million on your contract. We're going to give it to you. <laughs> I said, what time do you want me to leave? What door you want me out of, brother? <laughs> I'm so grateful of my How much fun is that guy? There is nobody on the planet that loves being Coach O more than Coach O. <laughs> right? He, I believe that's what Chris said in our, uh, in our group chat, but he really enjoys himself, and I, I fully believe that this happened exactly that way uh, because I don't think he was having fun being the coach there anymore once 2020 got here. I think he was out of there. Like, he won that national championship, and he started to, once the COVID stuff happened and whatnot, I think he was out. I think it became way too much because, again, people talk about this with Nick Saban all the time. Trying to sustain that level is much more difficult than getting to the mountaintop one time. Trying to stay up there is what's the most difficult. And uh, and I think 2020, all the stuff that happened politically in the offseason and whatnot leading up to that season all of the uh, political activism that was going on in the sport, et cetera, all the different changes that happened leading into the 2021 season, and now, of course, leading into 2022. I think he uh, he was done. He was done. I don't think he has any ambition to coach again. Uh, he talked about his window there. He said mine was like six years. Cheers to him. Uh, but he, I, I will tell you, I'm, I'm hoping that he sticks around. I hope he continues to do interviews like this. I like him so much as a personality, where he's just on the mic because he has a good time, and I, I fully enjoy that. Uh, last thing that I do want to hit on, I told you guys uh, the other day that we would hit on it on Thursday. We'll typically hit on these on uh, Tuesday. But college football ratings. Not going to spend a long time on this, but as you guys know, uh, I like to pay attention to what everybody is watching, etc., Looking at the numbers, we finally got them over at showbuzzdaily.com, uh, and you can keep up with these throughout the season. I will try and put together a little spreadsheet. I don't think Sports Media Watch is doing it anymore, so we'll uh, we'll try and keep up with it. But Notre Dame at Ohio State, final tally. I told you the other day it was like 8.5 million. Uh, incorrect. 10.531 million viewers on that one. Florida State, LSU, 7.554 million viewers. Oregon, Georgia was 6.199 million. And then after that, swap it over to uh, what happened on Monday, and ESPN here had 4.859 million for that standalone window with Clemson and Georgia Tech. Regardless of that game uh, and the way that it went, still a lot of viewers. But you jump back over here, that was the fourth most viewed, was on Monday night. Uh, But then you've got Saturday, you know, early game blowout. You've got Colorado State at Michigan Penn State at Purdue on uh, a Thursday night. That one did over $3 million, $3.5 million. Uh, West Virginia Pitt on Thursday did $3.1 million on ESPN, $2.9 million for Utah, Florida on ESPN. Cincinnati, Arkansas did $2.899 million. NC State, East Carolina had over $2 million. I mean, it is, it is bonkers looking at this. Now, what you don't see is North Carolina and App State, stuff like that that was on ESPNU, stuff that was on uh, the SEC Network, etc., because those are not reported numbers. So you're only going to get ESPN, ESPN2, ABC, all the network television and whatnot. Uh, but the interesting, interesting point here from Mike Mulvihill, who's the executive vice president for Fox Sports. He shared this out and said... Total viewing of all college football through Monday night is up plus 2% over 2021, over opening week 2021. Total TV use for the week that ended Sunday was down 5%. So the total number of television viewers went down by 5%, and yet the viewership for college football went up 2%. It said, once again, football up, TV down, could be a thread through the season. It's very interesting to see these numbers. Because this is exactly why these networks are paying so much in media rights to these conferences. The Big Ten got over a billion dollars a year. SEC is going to do the exact same thing, and it will continue on and on because live sports is the only place where you can actually toss in advertisements anymore. That is the way it goes. All right, let's hit an ad, and we will jump on 
uh, where game day is going for week three, et cetera, our preview for the week. I do have picks coming up as well. And we've got an interview at the end of the show with Ravi Lula, who, of course, is a contributor for 1620 The Zone in Omaha, Nebraska. Uh, we talk a little Nebraska football at the end of the show. But let's go on and hit this thing first. Let's check out some things you should know about. College football is back, and BetUS TV has you covered. Every Tuesday and Wednesday at 1 p.m. Eastern, we've got expert game analysis to help you make informed decisions before kickoff, only on the BetUS TV College Football Channel. Visit winningcureseverything.com to find everything you need to know about us, including full shows in video or podcast form, gambling picks, merch, the gear we use, and more. If you want more content from me, Gary, visit BetUSTV.com. I host the How to Gamble on Sports Show and, from August through January, the BetUS College Football Show. You can subscribe to both on YouTube. If you haven't already, subscribe to the podcast on Apple, Spotify, or whatever's your favorite podcast app. And if your app allows it, leave a five-star written review. Visit the Winning Cures Everything web store to get all kinds of football shirts, hats, hoodies, mugs, and more. Visit winningcureseverything.com slash store to see what all we've added. And now, back to the show. All right, let's get into it. Our preview for next week for, well, not next week, for this week. College football week two preview. We're going to start off with this. Where is college game day going for week three? Now, I ask this question every single week, and it is a very quick thing to go through. Uh, But you look at the schedule for week three, and you see there is not a ton uh, that is going on as far as ranked matchups. I mean, we're... We're not looking at anything major here. Uh, Virginia Tech and Wofford is early. uh, And, of course, Virginia Tech might be 0-2 at that point. But uh, you do have Georgia-South Carolina next week. If South Carolina ends up going into Arkansas and getting a win there in Fayetteville, then maybe you go there. Uh, You do have Oklahoma-Nebraska. That one could be interesting. I would have almost guaranteed that they would have been in Lincoln next week had it not been for Nebraska losing that week one matchup against Northwestern. I do have written down here. Penn State at Auburn. Now, these are two teams. This is a 2.30 p.m. Central Time kick. Both of these teams are 1-0 at this point. Both of them play teams that they should beat in Week 2. We'll say that. Auburn has San Jose State. Penn State has Ohio. Both of those go in 2-0. It is a CBS game, but maybe, maybe you find a way to get ESPN College Game Day on the Plains. I mean, all the storylines around that are, are pretty insane. So, uh, where where do I think that they will end up going? Now, I've brought up Georgia, South Carolina. I've brought up Oklahoma, Nebraska. And I've brought up Penn State and Auburn, where I think that they will go. Uh, you can't do Oregon. One, it's a Fox game. Uh, and two, it's out west. Three, um, BYU might lose this weekend. I mean, who knows? They do host Baylor. I think they're going to win, but regardless... Uh, Oregon getting smashed in week one just does not add a lot to that one, so that def- that doesn't help anything. And then, of course, you go down all the way to the night game on ESPN. And at 8 p.m. Central Time, you have Texas A&M hosting Miami. This is a top 15 matchup. And I will tell you, I think that's where they're going to go. I think they're going to Kyle Field. I don't know that they're going to have a lot of other opportunities to do that this season. So as long as you get both of these teams to win this weekend, Miami has Southern Miss and Texas A&M, of course, has App State. You get two wins there. I think that you are going to go to a top 15 battle at Kyle Field. I think that that is the way that they will go. All right. Now let's get into the actual preview for week two. And you guys know how I love to do this. Uh, The biggest brand games. Who is going to get the highest ratings this weekend? Well, you do, of course, have Alabama, Texas. That is the easy one, right? We know that that one's going to lead, as far as viewership, to massive brands. It's in that noon window on Fox, which has proven to be a successful time window. Uh, That one's going to be it. After that, I think your second one is going to be Tennessee Pitt on ABC. That is a 2.30 p.m. Central Time kick. I think that that's going to be your next go-to, but we'll see, obviously. Kentucky at Florida, ESPN game, 6 p.m. Central, I believe. Uh, That one, I think, is going to be number three. 
I could be wrong about that because I think ABC's primetime window, USC at Stanford, that one could because of the number of people that want to see Lincoln Riley face a good team for the first time at USC. It's his first time in a primetime window. Uh, so, you know, we'll go on and toss that. We'll, we'll make USC at Stanford number three. We'll make Kentucky at Florida number four. And then Baylor at BYU, the late game on ESPN, is going to be the fifth spot here. Uh, the most exciting games, closest games this week. Uh, I, I cannot wait to watch Oregon State and Fresno State. Jake Hayner going up against Chance Nolan, Jonathan Smith in that offense. I uh, heard the guys on Split Zone Duo this week. I think it was Godfrey that was talking about the fact that uh, Oregon State is effectively Boise State from the late Peterson into Brian Harson years. I mean, that's, that's exactly what they've turned into. Uh, and they look fun. Now, Fresno, of course, you got Jeff Tedford back. That looks like it's going to be a lot of fun. I think that's going to be an insanely close game. Tennessee at Pitt has the chance to be really exciting. We saw the EPA stuff. If you watch the college football show on BetUS TV, I uh, talked about the fact that Keaton Slovis and Pitt's offense had five times the EPA per pass than they did per run, and yet Pitt ran the ball 62% of the time. If Pitt decides to throw the football here, I think they got a shot because I think Tennessee's run defense is actually pretty good. So... Ah, it's just crazy. Uh, I think it's going to be a lot of fun. I think it's going to be very interesting. Tennessee could run away with this thing, uh, but we got to see about that defense. We got to see what's going on there. All right, uh, the next close game that I've got here, most exciting game, UTSA at Army. These are the kind of games that can get a little funky. If anybody remembers the Wake Forest Army game last year that went seventy to fifty-two, yeah. That's what you can get into in some of these spots. You get a team that can't stop the run. You get a team that can't stop the pass, etc. UTSA, I think, is too athletic for them, but you could. This one could get pointsy because I, UTSA, I think, can stop the run a little bit. But it, it's been a long time since they've seen anything like what Army's going to throw at them. So this this could be interesting. And then finally, Houston at Texas Tech. It's a preview of a Big Twelve matchup that could be happening as early as next year. And Dana Holgerson, the way that he coached that UTSA game last year or last week, looked like he was just expecting to be able to moonwalk through a game at the Alamo Dome, which leads me to believe that he has been game prepping for Texas Tech because Texas Tech is the only team that beat them in the regular season last year. So I think he wants to go into Texas Tech and get a win. I expect a completely different game plan from Houston this week. Uh, In Texas Tech, of course, Tyler Shuck won the starting job, and he is out of there. Uh, He got injured. Now, it's supposed to be only for two or three weeks, but I think Donovan Smith is probably going to keep that job. But we'll, we'll see. We'll see how these things work out. Houston at Texas Tech is going to be another one. Which teams have the most to gain and the most to lose? Very interesting questions, right? Memphis and Navy both have the most to gain and the most to lose. They both started off with big losses. Uh, Navy's wasn't so big. It was just the impact of that game because they lost 14-7 to to Delaware at home. Uh, their first eight drives, I believe four of them were like ended in fumbles. I mean, just just not good. Uh, I You... Anybody that listened to the show last year knows how much I I thought of Ty Lavatai, the, the quarterback at Navy, but it does not appear to be working for Ken Niamatololo. Uh, and as far as Memphis goes, I mean, Ryan Silverfield, mm, we're going to talk more about the game here in a little bit, uh, but it's there's questions on the road for Memphis there. Uh, Iowa, if they lose this game, uh, I think they've got the most to lose against Iowa State. Uh, you've beaten Matt Campbell every time you've played him. But this offense looks so dreadful. I mean, it is so bad. If they lose this game, you have to start wondering when is Kirk Ferentz going to pull the plug on his own son as the OC and quarterbacks coach. Uh, The comments that he made this week were not good because he effectively threw Petrus under the bus. And yet they're still going to roll with Petrus this week as the quarterback. So uh, Houston has the most to gain against Texas Tech. You get through this game, you got a shot at going 12-0. Now, is it going to be enough to make it to the playoff? Eh, probably not because the schedule's not there. But, I mean, we'll see. You you don't have a Notre Dame on the schedule like Cincinnati did last year. So, if you're going to go undefeated, all you got to do is go on the road and beat Texas Tech. Joey McGuire's first year? Just saying. Just saying. West Virginia has the most to lose when they face off against Kansas this weekend. Kansas looked good. They looked competent. This is a culture that has been built far quicker than I think anybody thought that they would be under 
the new coach, Lance Leipold. Of course, came over from Buffalo, but they're, I mean, their quarterback looks awesome. Daniels, uh, he, everything about this team looks so much more organized. And when, and if you, if you have the chance, go back, go on YouTube and go watch like the quick clip of the Kansas game last week against Tennessee Tech. And this is a functional football team with some surprising athletes. I'm shocked at how quickly he was able to get this thing turned around. It's not saying that they're going to go 6-6 six and six or anything like that. They still have a long ways to go. But as far as the organization goes of this program, he has gotten that thing turned around quick. West Virginia, you got problems if you lose this game, obviously. Uh, because I Neil Brown losing that, that game in the way that he did against Pitt... Not to mention this is a big time year because they expected, you know, some pretty big things and it's it's been I think this is year four now. Uh you gotta you gotta start moving forward. You gotta progress. Uh you gotta progress at some point. South Carolina at Arkansas. Both of these teams have the most to gain with a win this weekend, uh, because I think they both had around the same uh win total. If you can if you can knock that thing out, that would certainly be helpful. You get this one, it's going to get you to that point, I believe, uh, to get that over. Now, moving on from there, uh, the most likely 10-point underdog uh, that is an outright winner. We almost hit again last week with East Carolina. Almost. Now, we did hit with Northwestern in Week 0. Almost got East Carolina last week. Uh, This week, I got Kansas, plus 13 at West Virginia. That is a sneaky, tricky situation. West Virginia coming off of an emotional loss. Yes, they're going to be at home. But Kansas, very easy to overlook. Very easy to overlook. And then I've got Arizona State plus 11 at Oklahoma State. Uh, Count out Herm Edwards at your own risk. I said this on the Bet U.S. College Football Show. That is still a good coach. I don't know what the situation with the assistants is. But I do know that they brought in some transfers. A lot of guys that are willing to fight for him. Obviously, they like him because they transferred there. It's still early in the season. Just saying, like Oklahoma State, they uh, yes, I understand garbage time last week. Central Michigan was able to put up a bunch. Oklahoma State did look good going up 51-15 to 15 early. But eh, this is a different beast. I think Arizona State probably better than Central Michigan, I would assume. But regardless, uh, that's the way it goes. And finally, G5 game of the week this week. I got four of them here. UTSA and Army. Already spent a little bit of time on that. Houston versus Texas Tech. Obviously, Houston is a G5 school. They will be P5, quote-unquote P5, whatever the hell that means anymore. Uh, but Houston versus Texas Tech, uh, that's going to be big for the G5s because that, that could determine whether or not Houston ends up in a New Year's Six Bowl, so that could take us a lot away from somebody else. UAB versus Liberty. That could be interesting. Brian Vincent's first big-time game. Uh, they did beat Alabama A&M in Week 1, 59 to nothing. But first, a big-time game for Brian Vincent uh, as head coach at UAB. And that goes up against Hugh Freeze at Liberty. Um, we're going to talk more about this game here in a minute. And then finally, Old Dominion in, uh, Excuse me, Old Dominion coming off of a big-time win over Virginia Tech at home. They travel to ECU, who, of course, is coming off of a heartbreaking last-second loss to NC State. They should have won the game. Two missed kicks, an extra point, and a field goal at the end of the game uh, cost them. They lost 21-20. to how are they going to bounce back against Old Dominion? A team that they should beat, but who, uh, you know, found a way to get it done against Virginia Tech. Just saying. All right, let's hit ad number two, and then we are going through the college football under-the-radar pick them against the spread for week two. Let's check out some things you should know about. Follow the show on Twitter at Winning Cures, and you can follow Gary at Gary WCE. You can also follow on Facebook. Got your own podcast or web show, looking to start one, or you're just curious how we look and sound so good? Well, we've got all the gear that we use listed on our gear page on the website. If you order using our links, you'll be supporting the show too. Subscribe on YouTube to get not only full Winning Cures Everything shows, but individual segments and other goodies as well. We're over 6,000 subscribers, and our goal by the end of the year is 7,500. If you're interested in advertising on a show that reaches over 80,000 unique football fans per month during the season, send an email to Gary at winningcureseverything.com and we'll put together a plan that best fits you or your business. And now, back to the show. 
All right, college football under the radar against the spread. Pick them for week number two. Last week, those of you who doubted, I went nine and three against the number. Going to toss them back out here again uh, very shortly. By week four, uh, I believe I'm going to start using uh, current numbers and whatnot as opposed to basing it on uh, totally gut feel. But so far, uh, it's worked out well. And I will start having spreadsheets and whatnot up on the show. But for now, went 9-3 and three last week. This, of course, brought to you by BetUS, where the game begins. It's America's premier online sports book. Go over to BetUS.com. Make sure that you are signed up. And make sure that you sign up for the picks contest over at WinningCuresEverything.com. Very easy to do. There's a contest section. Also, you can look for the link on my Twitter page. It's very easy to do. Go follow me at GaryWCE. Now, with that said... Game number one here, and I'm going to try and write my times down fairly quickly. Game one, Southern Miss at Miami. Now, again, these are under-the-radar games. Miami is a 25-point favorite currently at BetUS. Total is 51. It's a 12 p.m. Eastern time game on the ACC Network. Looking at some of the trends here, Southern Miss 4-0 against the spread in their last four non-conference games. You've got 2-6 against the spread after a loss. They are also 2-8 and eight against the spread in September. Miami on the other side. Uh, not much better, 3-7 and seven against the spread. In their last 10 non-conference games, they are 2-6 and six against the spread at home against losing teams. This line has bounced around a ton. Uh, it's gone from 25 up to 28, back down to 25. It's, I mean, it's just all over the place. Uh, this is not the same Miami team, I don't believe. I think this is a competent, well-run organization. I'm going to take Miami to cover here. Tyler Van Dyke looks good. Uh, Southern Miss with the quarterback situation. Yeah, they. So, of course, Keys, the, the starting quarterback, goes out with a concussion last week. And, you know, we'll see if he's going to play this week. Who knows? But he goes out with a concussion. The backup quarterback comes in, immediately throws an interception, and then they run Frank Gore Jr., the running back, at quarterback for the rest of the game. It's exactly what they did last season. They were successful with it last season. But, of course, they end up losing the game to Liberty. Uh, I think going on the road to Miami, Miami is too much. This is way too talented. I'm going to take Miami to cover this. I, I like them by four touchdowns here, so I will take the Hurricanes on that one. Now, moving on, UTSA heading to Army, and I am I'm pumped. I'm pumped. I want to see this game. I'm going to have it on one of my other screens. Of course, I've got five screens that I watch football on. I've got a main one and then four others. Uh, UTSA is currently a two-and-a-half-point favorite. Latest line over at BetUS. Total is 54-and-a-half. This one's on CBS Sports Network at noon Eastern. Uh, UTSA 5-0 and against the spread in their last five in September. They are 9-1 and against the number following a straight-up loss. Of course, they lost in overtime to Houston last week. Uh, Army. Two and five against the spread, their last seven at home. They are one and four against the spread in their last five games overall. Uh, I am concerned about the Army quarterback situation here uh, after losing those guys last year. And yes, they were able to put up some points on Coastal Carolina, but don't forget that is a Coastal Carolina defense that lost quite a few guys. Uh, the cut block issues, uh, the rule change that the NCAA implemented is really going to affect service academies big time here. I don't think that we've seen that adjusted in the line just yet. Uh, UTSA, way more athletic, way more talented. I am going to take UC, uh, UTSA to win this game. I think if UTSA had won that game against Houston, I might would be picking the other way here. But I, I think UTSA bounces back. They cover this two-and-a-half-point spread here. I like UTSA on this one. We have another game. SEC, noon. This one's going to be on ESPN. South Carolina heads to Reynolds Razorback Stadium in Fayetteville, Arkansas. And Arkansas currently an eight-point favorite at BetUS. The total sits at 53, which is kind of a low number, uh, at least to me initially. Arkansas 7-0 against the spread their last seven in September. They, they start out seasons pretty well. They are 7-3 against the spread of their last 10 at home. That does include last week's game against Cincinnati. They closed as a six-and-a-half-point favorite. And they, of course, won by seven. So, South Carolina won six and one against the spread their last eight road games. They are 0 and 4 against the spread following a straight up win. That is not trending in the way that I would have thought. But when I look at this, Arkansas, injury issues in the secondary. 
South Carolina did not play all that well in their opening night game. A lot of pressure week one for Spencer Rattler and that bunch. I think going on the road in week two, I think the passing game will be considerably better. This does not feel like a two-possession game to me, so I will take South Carolina to keep this one relatively close. Uh, I think they can win the game. They've got the special team's advantage. So I like South Carolina here a lot. I think they can win outright, so I'm certainly going to take them plus eight. Give me the Gamecocks on that one. Now we move along. North Carolina at Georgia State. Interesting game. This one's in Atlanta. It is at uh, whatever the the field is called, formerly Turner Field, but Georgia State's new football stadium. And that place is pretty awesome, by the way. Georgia State is a seven and a half point home dog. Latest line over at BetUS. The total sits at 64 and a half. It's 12 p.m. Eastern Time, ESPNU game. And I like what Georgia State was able to do last week against South Carolina. Now, yes, there was all the mess with the special teams and everything else. North Carolina, I don't believe, has an advantage over them in that aspect of the game. Uh, North Carolina is going to be able to score. Georgia State's defense, I think, is okay. I think they're pretty good. So they may be able to slow them down a little bit. North Carolina 0-4 against the spread following a spread win. Now, remember, week zero, they did not cover that spread against Florida A&M. Uh, they are 1-4 and against the spread in their last five non-conference games. Uh, Georgia State 6-1 and against the spread versus a team with a winning record. That is pretty good. And they are 4-1 and against the spread following a spread loss. They did not cover the spread against South Carolina last week, so that puts them in spots for this one. Georgia State likes to run the football. They will be able to run the football. I like Granger, that quarterback and whatnot, but that running back room is legit. They've got a good offensive line. I believe they will be able to run the ball on North Carolina, and they're going to hold the ball, and they are going to keep it away from North Carolina. I like Georgia State to stay in this game, plus 7.5. I get the hook here. Give me Georgia State at home. I think they can keep up with these guys. Yes, I still think Drake May and that bunch are going to score. I don't know what the status is on Josh Downs. I don't think it matters. I think Georgia State is going to be able to stay in this ball game, so I'm going to take the Panthers here. I like them. I like what they're doing, so give me Georgia State on that one to cover seven and a half. Uh, let's see. Moving right along. Oh, here we go. Memphis and Navy. Now, Anxiety Bowl, anybody? Anybody, uh, you know, Hot Seat Bowl maybe? Something along those lines? Navy is a six-point underdog at home. It's a 3.30 p.m. Eastern Time CBS Sports Network game. Uh, the total sits at 50.5. Of course, these lines, courtesy of BetUS, Memphis 0-10 against the spread under Ryan Silverfield. That is an issue. That is an issue. Uh, they are 1-4 against the spread versus losing teams. Uh, Navy 4-0 against the spread after a straight-up loss. And they are 9-0 and against the spread against a losing team. Of course, Memphis got blasted by uh, Mississippi State last week. Navy also lost to Delaware. Uh, again, with the cut block rule that the NCAA implemented in the offseason. That is going to affect uh, the service academies. Memphis has always had issues with Navy. They just have. That triple option, the way that they do it. Now, maybe the cut block stuff changes that this year. Uh, but this feels like it's too many points here. I could see this being a field goal either way. Memphis, for whatever reason, does not play well on the road. So I will take Navy to cover the six here, uh, knowing that one of these, some, somebody's in trouble. Somebody's in trouble here. I'll just tell you. Moving right along, Washington State at Wisconsin. And what a, what a fun, interesting, unique ball game this one is. This is a 3.30 p.m. Eastern time game on Fox. It's on Big Fox. Should do some pretty good ratings. And, you know, as all the realignment and expansion and whatnot, people have been diving into TV numbers, Washington State tends to draw a pretty good crowd for whatever reason. So they will continue to do so here, I would imagine, with the big-name brand that is Wisconsin. Wisconsin, a 17.5-point favorite latest line at BetUS. Total sits at 49. Washington State, 1-5 and five against the spread against the Big Ten. They are 1-8 and eight against the spread their last nine games in September. They do not start off seasons well, and they certainly did not start off well last week. Cam Ward looking not so good against Idaho State. Uh, I think they won that game 24-17. to 17. It was not pretty at all. Um, I mean, they, they played the backup quarterback. It was just all kinds of problems. You expected a little bit more continuity after Jake Dicker took them to a bowl game last year, but, of course, they lost the bowl game. Jaden Delara transfers out, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, you got all kind of problems there. So, 
Um, Wisconsin, 2-5 and five against the spread against the Pac-12. I think that they're playing a little bit different level of competition than Washington State, but obviously. 5-1 uh, and one against the spread uh, after allowing less than 20 points. Paul Christ likes to keep that thing rolling. I think he's going to do the same thing here. Give me Wisconsin minus 17 and a half. That offensive line looks good. They are back to doing what they do, bashing people. And they are going to incredibly outclass the line of scrimmage for Washington State. It's not even close. Like, I just, I, I can't see any world where Wisconsin doesn't win this by, by three touchdowns. I just don't see it. And the reason for that is I don't think Washington State is going to score. I do think Wisconsin can get to, what, 24 at least, 28 against Washington State. Uh, and that's only if they decide to go full service academy and just decide to run, like, five total drives for the entire game. Like, I think they could do that if they want to. So give, give me Wisconsin to cover in this one. Next up, we got Virginia at Illinois, and that's an interesting ball game. Uh, Brett Bielema, of course, went to Virginia last year and got smoked by Bronco Menden, uh, Mendo, eh, Bronco Mendenhall in that bunch. Uh, Illinois is a four and a half point favorite. Latest line over at BetUS: the total sits at fifty seven and a half. It's a four p.m. Eastern time ESPNU game. In this spot, UVA eight and three against the spread following a straight up win. They are seven and three against the spread after a spread loss. And that's exactly what happened against Richmond last week. Uh, Illinois 5-0-1 against the spread after a straight-up loss. They are 5-0-1 against the spread in their last six against a winning team. But they are 1-7-1. and No, excuse me, 1-5-1 and against the spread in their last seven non-conference games. Uh, this line, four and a half. Uh, now, I understand Tony Elliott's the new head coach at Virginia. Uh, they are replacing their entire offensive line, etc. They did not look good early against Richmond, but they got that thing turned around. Brendan Armstrong looks pretty good. Uh, in this situation, because the Illinois secondary did look questionable to me against Indiana last week. I mean, Indiana, Connor Bazelak was able to throw the ball just all over them. They they had holes in that secondary you could drive a Mack truck through. It was nuts. Um, I don't think that they can get that fixed immediately. So I think that Brennan Armstrong is going to be able to find some guys open. And in doing that, I think they're going to score some points. Illinois, not really cut out to score a ton of points. So with that said, I believe I'm going to take Virginia to cover the four and a half here. I don't know that they win the game outright, but four and a half, I mean, 21 to 17, I still get the cover. So I, I will take Virginia because that just feels like too many points. That, that Illinois secondary scares me. Uh, we'll see what Tommy DeVito looks like this week. I, I don't have I, the Virginia defense is eh. I think Illinois can have success against them, but uh, at the same time, I think Virginia their passing attack can have some success even with the rebuilt offensive line. I think they can have success against Illinois' defense. So, and moving on from there, we've got a few more games here. App State, App State heads to Kyle Field, and man alive, uh, do we have a a thing here. App State coming off of an emotional home loss. They thought they had that game won multiple times uh, against North Carolina. And now they get to go on the road to a team who actually has a defense. That's the biggest thing for Texas A&M. A&M, by the way, a 19-point favorite at home. Total is 54. Latest line over at BetUS. This is a 3.30 p.m. Eastern time game. It's on ESPN2. Uh, looking at some of the trends here, App State minus, uh, excuse me, App State 1-6 and six against the spread, their last seven on the road against a winning team, and they are also 0-4 against the spread, their last four non-conference games. That does not bode well in this situation. Texas A&M 6-1 and one against the spread following a spread loss, and they are 16-5 and five against the spread in their last 21 non-conference games. Jimbo Fisher likes to run up the score if he's given the opportunity. Chase Bryce made North Carolina's defense look silly last week. But when Chase Bryce goes up against a really good defense, it, things have not gone well. We'll just say that. And Texas A&M does have a really good defense. I mean, they are going to out-athlete App State on a level that they didn't even come close to seeing last week at home. Uh, I am going to take Texas A&M. I think a lot of people want to buy into this App State thing because they put up so many points last week. <laughs> there is a chasm of difference between Texas A&M and North Carolina. It's not even close. And the only way that I could see App State covering this 
is if you get multiple Haynes King turnovers. Now, that is not outside the realm of possibilities, but I don't foresee it happening. I see Texas A&M trying to establish the run more in this game. Uh, Chase Bryce making a few mistakes, and that will lead to, you know, 21 to 24 point victory for Texas A&M, and it'll be a snoozer. That's just the way that I'm seeing it. This is not anything against you, App State. Just the way that I see this game going, especially coming off of a uh, loss like that. I mean, it's it's situational. Situational, for sure. Moving along, Houston. Houston going to Texas Tech. I brought this one up just a little bit ago. And Dana Holgerson, of course, heading to Lubbock, Texas. My goodness. Uh, he loves to show out against Big 12 competition after leaving West Virginia, and he gets another opportunity to do so. Texas Tech is a three-and-a-half-point favorite at home. The latest line over at BetUS, and the total sits at 63, so they expect points. It's a 4 p.m. Eastern time game on FS1. Uh, Houston, 5-1 and one against the spread following a spread loss. However, they are 1-4 and four their last five against the spread against winning teams. Uh, Texas Tech, 4-1 and one against the spread against the AAC in their last five matchups. However, coming off of a spread win, they are 1-5-1. and one. That is their last seven after a spread win, and they did get a spread win last week. So, uh, Houston... The way that that game went last week against UTSA, it looked like those guys thought that they were just going to walk into the Alamo Dome and be able to sneak out with a win, and they didn't have to really fully prepare for it, etc. And they got lucky, and they did, in fact, get a win in quadruple overtime, or three overtimes, or whatever it was. A lot of overtime. They, they, got, to, they got to the two-point conversions, right? But Clayton Toon bailed them out. They found ways to make plays at the end of the game, even though they were down 21-7 to going into the fourth quarter. And they ended up winning the game 37-35. to 35. Uh, Yes, Texas Tech is a little bit of a different deal than UTSA. I don't believe that Texas Tech is better coached than UTSA. And I don't believe that this game means as much to Texas Tech as it did to UTSA. With that being said, Dana Holgerson, in this spot, I think will be able to shock Texas Tech. Plus three and a half here. I'm going to take the Cougars. I like what they're doing. I think that they are going to be much more prepared for this because I think they were preparing for this game more so than the last game. Remember, this is a future Big 12 matchup. That's the way that I see this. I think Clayton Toon is going to have a lot of success against that Texas Tech secondary. Look, I like Smith. I like what he's doing at quarterback there. I don't think he is the ideal quarterback that Kitley wanted to run with, and I think there's going to be some growing pains in this game. Uh, Now, don't forget, Doug Belk, the defense coordinator at Houston, uh, really, really good last year. I expect him to have a game plan out of this world for this weekend. So we will see, but I will take Houston plus three and a half in this spot. All right, moving along, we've got three more games to hit here. And we're going UAB at Liberty. Liberty, a six and a half point underdog at home. Total of 50 over at BetUS. 6 p.m. Eastern Time on ESPN+. Plus. That's right, this is a streaming special. So make sure that you have your subscription to ESPN+. Plus. Uh, UAB, 6-0 against the spread on the road. They are 5-0 against the spread. Their last five against winning teams. They are 5-1 and one against the spread. Their last six in September. Now, yes, I do know that they have a new coach, Brian Vincent. Uh, this is his first big-time spot. He gets to show what he's got. They got all their dudes, and they are ready to roll. And, yes, UAB power-rated really highly. So this is going to be interesting to see. However, Liberty 9-2 and two against the spread their last 11 at home. They are 4-1 and one against the spread against the Conference USA. I look at this, and I will tell you, I, watching UAB against Alabama A&M shows you nothing. Uh, this game last year, Liberty won 36-12. to And no, they don't have Malik Willis anymore. I understand that. But uh, Charlie Brewer, of course, getting hurt. The quarterback gets hurt. Game one, he's going to be out for a while for Liberty. But man, they brought in uh, that Salter kid last week, the quarterback. And he was, I was impressed. I think he maybe should have been starting from the very get-go. He looks like he has got something when them lights are on. Uh, I like I like Liberty. I like Liberty here. I think they're going to cover the six and a half. I think it will be a close game, but I do like uh, I do like Liberty to be able to cover at home. I think they're going to play with a little bit of pride. They snuck out. They found a way to get that win. And yeah, I think you got a little bit of a coaching advantage with Hugh Freeze over Brian Vincent. Obviously, one has been around for a long, long time, coaching the SEC, et cetera. Uh, wasn't fired for performance. 
I will tell you that. But regardless, uh, Brian Vincent, first-time head coach, going on the road. This could be tricky. I will take Liberty to cover six and a half, even though I, I do believe that UAB is the better team overall. I think Liberty could get this win. Just saying. All right, moving along, we got two more, and we are already over an hour, and we have an interview. <laughs> All right, Kansas at West Virginia. West Virginia, a 13.5 point favorite. Total sits at 50 over at BetUS, 6 p.m. Eastern time on ESPN+. Plus. That's right, it's another ESPN Plus streaming special for the Big 12, Kansas. Guys, 6-20 and 20 against the spread after a straight-up win. Uh, they are 22-46-1 in their last 69 road games. It is putrid. It is awful. Uh, West Virginia, 4-0 and against the spread in September. They are 9-2-1 and against the spread their last 12 at home. They do play better in Morgantown for sure. Uh, that is an emotional uh, loss that they took against their rival last week, West Virginia. Kansas. I did mention in the preview earlier, that team looks functional. It looks like they have completely rebuilt that organization, and it is humming right now. They've got better athletes than I thought that they would at Kansas in year two under Lance Leipold. Neil Brown, uh, this is a pressure spot because you are expected to win this game. You are expected to win this game big. Yes, I know that you've got JT Daniels. Things looked pretty good, and you probably should have won that game if the ball doesn't bounce off of that kid's hands against Pitt. That's the that's the way that this goes. So yeah, I'm I think Kansas puts the fear of God into them. I think Kansas could win this game. So you're giving me 13 and a half. Yeah, I, I think I'm going to take that. And the reason being there's so much pressure on Neil Brown and that coaching staff to be able to get a win. And not just to get a win, but to get a convincing win. I don't think they'll be able to do it. I think they're going to make mistakes. I think there's going to be problems. They could win the game. This feels much more like, I'll tell you this, my number on it was 10. So I'm getting three and a half points of added value here. Uh, yeah, I'll take I'll take the Jayhawks. I mean, it's, it's a scary thing to do to bet on Kansas. But I do like the Jayhawks here. So I will take them against West Virginia plus 13 and a half over bet US. Finally, last game here. Interesting, interesting spot. Late night game. I say late night. It's a 7 p.m. Central time game, 8 p.m. Eastern time game on ACC Network. Boston College at Virginia Tech. And the Hokies are a two-and-a-half point favorite over at BetUS. The total sits at 46 here. Trends on this. Virginia Tech, 1-5 and five against the spread their last six at home. They are 3-9 and nine against the spread their last 12 overall. Now That, of course, dates back into the Justin Fuente era. But game number one for Britt Pride did not go well. Grant Wells is throwing the ball to the wrong color jerseys over and over and over again. It's just not good. Just not good. Uh, on the other side, though, Boston College, 2-5 and five against the spread. Their last seven against the ACC. They are 1-4 and four against the spread after a straight-up loss. And, yes, this team lost at home to Rutgers last week. The defense did not look good. The offense turned the football over three different times. I like Phil Dracovich. I like Zay Flowers. I like Jeff Halfley. I also like Brent Pry. I think Brent Pry has a longer way to go to get things right than Boston College. Jeff Halfley has a two-year head start on him. Brent Pry is going to have to rework this thing because what Fuente left him with is a disaster. It's a mess. It's not the roster that Pry wants to work with, and you got a quarterback that has the yips, a quarterback that is totally fine with slinging that thing no matter who's going to catch it. And I was hoping that Grant Wells would be better, and maybe he does perform better at home, but for my money, I'm going to bet on the better quarterback here, and that is going to be Phil Dracovich. I'm going to take BC to cover the two and a half here uh, because these two teams, I mean, both of them need, both of them need something good to happen. And and I will take Boston College in that spot because I think they're, I think they're a little further ahead. And so that is going to wrap up the pick em for week two. Uh, and that is the uh, under-the-radar pick them. Don't forget, go enter the contest. It's brought to you by BetUS. The contest, of course, over at winningcureseverything.com slash contest. Uh, there is also a link in the description, so make sure that you go sign up for that. The winner gets a $25 Amazon gift card. And if I'm not mistaken, and I didn't put this out on the tweet, if I'm not mistaken, I think you get a $50 free play with BetUS. Now, you'll have to have a BetUS account. 
But we'll, we'll figure that out as we go. You guys can reach out to me. Just make sure that you sign up for the contest. Get your picks in. It's 10 different games. It's going to be a good time. Let's go ahead and hit one more ad, and then we are going to welcome in to the show uh, Ravi Lula. So let's, uh, let's knock this thing out. Let's check out some things you should know about. College football is back, and BetUS TV has you covered. Every Tuesday and Wednesday at 1 p.m. Eastern, we've got expert game analysis to help you make informed decisions before kickoff, only on the BetUS TV College Football Channel. Visit winningcureseverything.com to find everything you need to know about us, including full shows in video or podcast form, gambling picks, merch, the gear we use, and more. If you want more content from me, Gary, visit BetUSTV.com. I host the How to Gamble on Sports Show and, from August through January, the BetUS College Football Show. You can subscribe to both on YouTube. If you haven't already, subscribe to the podcast on Apple, Spotify, or whatever's your favorite podcast app. And if your app allows it, leave a five-star written review. Visit the Winning Cures Everything web store to get all kinds of football shirts, hats, hoodies, mugs, and more. Visit winningcureseverything.com slash store to see what all we've added. And now, back to the show. All right, we'll go ahead and welcome in to talk a little bit of Nebraska football. What is going on with Scott Frost, etc.? He is Ravi Lula. He's a contributor to 1620 The Zone in Omaha, Nebraska. Uh, you check him out on Twitter, at R-A Lula. That's right, Ra Lula, R-A-L-U-L-L-A. Uh, let's dive into it. All right, I'd love to welcome to the show Ravi Lula. He is a contributor for 1620 in Omaha and uh, it knows a little little bit here and there about Nebraska football. Uh, I had one of his tweets on the show not that long ago when we were talking about coaching candidates for the Nebraska football job. Ravi, uh, what is going on in Nebraska? It felt like Fred Hoiberg and Scott Frost were both can't miss hires. It's maybe taking a little longer to build up what they want to do. What is what is happening with Scott Frost's football program? Yeah, I mean, honestly, you you brought up both those guys. They were both home runs. I mean, not just locally. I think every. I mean, I didn't even think they could get Hoiberg. Like, <laughs> I, I didn't think that was an option. And when it was like, oh no, this might happen, that was a huge deal. The Frost thing, obviously, he seemed gettable, but it seemed like a home run. It didn't seem like there was any question that this was going to work. I mean, it wasn't just a Nebraska guy getting a Nebraska job. Like Florida wanted him, UCLA wanted him. Like he was the guy in that hiring cycle. And, you know, and I think I realized maybe more than some that his resume was a little lighter than it appeared on paper. Um, He didn't call plays the whole time at Oregon. He had only had the two years, obviously at UCF and, UCF, despite the 0-12, was not in that bad of shape. Like, it was a really smart job for him to take because they were, like, 9-4 and the year before they went 0-12. Oh, and, yeah. and, you know, like, they were a really good program for most of the most of the last 20 years, basically. And so he stepped into a really good spot there. And so you're like, okay, maybe the turnaround's not as dramatic as it seems. But even, even having acknowledged that, I still thought it was a home run. It was the hire they had to make. And that's basically the last time anything has gone right for Nebraska and Scott Frost um, was the, was the press conference, you know? Oh yeah. Um, It's been, you know, from the weirdness of his first game getting canceled because of a thunderstorm against Akron back in what 2018 now to starting off. Oh, and six to just all the, there's just been so much weirdness the entire time. And and then the, the COVID season, right? The 2020 season, they were the ones that we want to play. Right, yeah. we we want to do this, and it felt like the Big Ten uh, was a little irritated at them for that. So the scheduling gods didn't exactly help things out with you know scheduling Ohio State really early, and now of course you had the uh, the game in Ireland. It, it's just it's been a mess ever since. It it really has the whole. Th- I mean, yeah, the the COVID season. It's funny that of all the weirdness with Nebraska football, COVID season is like barely in the top five. <laughs> <laughs> um, with what's been going on there. I mean, there's obviously you've got the coaching staff shakeups. You've got so much stuff going on around his, uh, around Scott Frost's program. And 
honestly, I think it all comes back to the head coach. There's been too many other moving parts. There's been too many, um, you know, this he's on his third offensive coordinator now in his fifth year. Um, you know, he's it's a lot out. of interchanging parts. It, it seems he never got real comfortable with his coaching staff. And I wonder if maybe that has a little bit to do with it, but more so this just seems like a coaching issue just from the top down. Every, it seems like there's been pressure at this job ever since he got there. You feel like that's maybe part of the problem. Uh, yeah. I don't know if it's the pressure or the mix of his pressure, the pressure and his personality. Um, honestly it's, and this is my personal opinion. I think he has a hard time taking responsibility for things. Um, <laughs> if you listen to his press conferences, if you, talk to people who've been around him at different points in his life or whatever. Um, I just don't think he's, I don't, I don't think he takes accountability for things. I, I, you hear him, you know, say that his team is snake bitten or it's like watching the same movie over and over again. It's like, man, you're the director of the movie. Like you get to change how it goes. Like you have this every time something goes wrong. And last year, a lot went wrong. And, you know, you had all these one score games and things like that that's not a coincidence at a certain point that's kind of baked into the culture of your program. And I think a lot of it has to do with the fact that he doesn't seem willing to take responsibility for his role in what's going on. And so why would players take the responsibility for their role in what's going on? Exactly. That press conference of- after the Northwestern game in Ireland where you know, and he came back and said, no, I wasn't throwing the offensive coordinator under the bus because Whipple has just been through it, right? Uh, yeah. Narduzzi has been bashing him ever since he left Pitt. And now, of course, he goes over, uh, gets what feels like a cush job, but it, still, you've seen him be able to have success, uh, yeah. maybe maybe at the detriment of, of the team itself. But, uh, you know, it, he comes out and immediately throws it, talks about being more creative in this league, et cetera. Eh, it's, I don't think the relationship has started off on a on a good foot to start things off. And then, of course, the North Dakota game last week, it wasn't the offense. It wasn't really one thing. It was just everything. The special teams blunders again, right? That's it, They finally hired a special teams coach, and you're still having the same problems. So it just and, continues on and on. And that's why I go back to the head coach because, okay, special teams coach, no special teams coach three different offensive coordinators, whether Frost is calling plays or not calling plays. They thought it was an Adrian problem. They bring in a new quarterback. It's not an Adrian problem. And talking about Adrian Martinez, (laughs) you know, like there's, there's so, there's been so many different parts that have come through here in the last four plus years into year five. Now that it's hard to put the point, the finger at anybody else. Yeah. Um, the, the defensive staff has been mostly intact, but the defense up until this year where they were replacing a lot of people and and kind of rebuilding on that side of the ball, the defense was really good last year. The defense has improved steadily over Chenander's time here. And so there's a level of confidence in what Chenander's doing, but especially on offense where Scott Frost is supposed to be this guru and and this offensive genius or whatever. And that's not to say that he is not a good offensive mind in football, but as a head coach, those two things have not gelled. And the fact that he threw Whipple under the bus, whether he says he did or not, um, you know, the fact that he threw Whipple under the bus after game one, when it's not like his offense has lit the world on fire either, you know, it's not like Frost. Oh, yeah. You know, if Frost was doing so good on offense, Whipple wouldn't be here. You know, Whipple wouldn't be in the conversation if they had, by the way, I think they only scored 28 points three times last year with Scott Frost running the running the show there. So, you know, it's not like he's been lighting the world on fire in the Big Ten with his super creative play calling. In fact, most of the time, it's he's shot himself in the foot with it. So, you know, the fact that he throws Whipple under the bus, you know, all the other comments I mentioned from, from previous years and previous press conferences, I think it comes back to a head coach accountability thing. And until that gets fixed, which... I don't know if at this point in your, you know, Scott Frost in his late forties, I don't know if that's something he's going to change about himself at this point in his life, but whether it's with Scott Frost or with a different head coach until that changes, Nebraska football won't change. And now tell me this, it, 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 what about the fan base? Is the fan base still firmly behind him or are they just waiting on the next guy already? I mean, what, what does it look like up there? So it's, it's a roller coaster with the, the way people feel about Frost and the way things have gone. 
when he got hired, obviously everybody was on board, which was a big deal for Nebraska because they'd been super polarized when Frank Solich got fired. Um, most people were pretty okay with Callahan getting fired, but it was super polarizing when Pelini got fired. Everybody, most people hated the fact that Mike Riley got hired in the first place. So it was, it's been an up and down kind of thing with the fan base over 20 years now. And so Frost getting hired and unifying everybody was a huge deal for uh, the Nebraska fan base. And honestly, people have stuck by him pretty well. It really started to fall apart around Purdue last year. That was the first time I felt like the majority of the fan base had really kind of turned on him. And then when Trev said, hey, we're going to keep him for the rest of the season or for next season, um, you know, people kind of backed off a little bit and cooled off. But, man, it was back after Northwestern. It was a pretty, um, pretty frustrated and angry fan base. Well, as you said, it was the same movie, right? Yeah. (laughs) Over and over. It is. It was almost – like all these new transfers and you've got new members on the coaching staff and it's supposed to be different. And this is a team that they beat by 49 points last year. Yep. And you went and made all these changes. And now that team has caught up to you in one off season. That's what makes it so weird. Well, that's the, that's the thing I keep pointing to with it. It's a head coaching thing. And it doesn't take, like it doesn't take this long in college football today. It doesn't take this long to get good. I mean, wake forest got good before Nebraska got good again, you know, and, um, you know, Illinois one year under Brett Bielema, they're five and seven, right. That yeah. would match the best year under Scott Frost. Like this isn't, this doesn't take that long. Lovey Smith fell his way into a bowl game, right? <laughs> like on accident. And he had no interest in being there whatsoever. Like this is not something that is hard. Making a bowl game in college football is not hard to do. No, people no, do it on accident. Right. And Nebraska hasn't been able to do that. They have actively been working against themselves to do something that pretty much every team in college football accidentally does over the course of a five or six year period. And that's the thing. Normally a college football team finds an identity at some point. It feels like in year five, we still have no idea what the identity of Nebraska football is other than, you know, that they are going to make a critical mistake at some point in the ballgame. And that's the identity. That's the thing that has really that's the Northwestern game really made put that in the focus for people. I think was the way that Pat Fitzgerald called that game down the stretch was, okay, I've got a three point lead. I'm just going to assume Nebraska can't beat me. And he had, I think, 11 and a half minutes left when he made that decision. They didn't throw another pass the rest of the game. They threw yeah, they went 12 to. straight runs. <laughs> they didn't throw a pass, even though Holinsky was dicing up the secondary. He's like. I'm just going to let Nebraska screw up. That's what they do. And it, he was right. That's <laughs> yes. the horrible part is the, he was right. And so, um, no, they have not found a positive identity for sure. Um, under Scott Frost, which again, that's kind of was supposed to be his whole thing. There was supposed to be an identity. There was supposed to be, uh, this ability to identify guys that fit the system. And they haven't been able to do that. They haven't developed guys. Well, um, they've recruited, for the most part, better than Iowa and Wisconsin. They pretty much always have. There's been a couple years over the last like decade where one or two or one or both of those teams have out recruited Nebraska. Nebraska brings in the talent. People always yeah. assume it's a talent issue at Nebraska. It's not. Not in the Big Ten West. You go up against Ohio State, yes, there's a <laughs> talent gap there. But in the Big Ten West, you've got you've got the best guns in the Big Ten West for the most part. This is a coaching and culture issue to the core. And Again, like I said, I, maybe Scott Frost can change his ways. It doesn't seem like he has so far this year. And I'm I'm on the boat that they have to find somebody else who can do it. That's a, So that was what I was wanting to get to. It, with all the realignment, with all the uh, expansion and whatnot, it, can Nebraska still be a successful football, uh, football program? Now, it, now, I guess the definition would change because sure. I don't know that they're going to be you know, three national titles in four years kind of program again. But being a good top-tier Big Ten West team, which in the divisions may go away eventually, but a team that can routinely get to nine wins every other year, right? Ten wins once in four years, something along those lines. But but be making bowl games every season, uh, you would have to believe that Nebraska could do that, right? Yeah, absolutely. For any university that pours the resources into their football program that Nebraska does, 
I always believe they have a chance to be relevant and be good again. Um, as you said, the definition of, of what relevant and good is matters here. But, you know, if you're, I understand this is all going to change, but assuming the current uh, infrastructure of college football, there's no reason Nebraska can't compete for the Big Ten West every year. Um, are they going to win it every year? No. But to be in that conversation the same way that Iowa and Wisconsin are, they should be in that conversation with them every year. It should be Iowa, Wisconsin, Nebraska, all kind of vying for the top. And depending on who's got the most guys coming back, who's got the better quarterback, like little things will determine who wins the division in, in that scenario. Not, hey, can Nebraska get over six wins this year? Um, <laughs> that's or at least get no two reason. six wins, right? <laughs> yes, get to a bowl game. There's no reason Nebraska shouldn't be in that scenario. And again, with the resources that they they pour into it. It just takes the right coaching hire and Nebraska hasn't gotten a lot of coaching hires right in the last 20 years, but yeah, since, since Osborne. Yeah. I mean, some people liked Pelini and at least there was a level of consistency there, but people that paid attention know that that wasn't going well. Um, he got blown out in every game that mattered. It's like, yes, he beat the teams he was supposed to, which we would take at this point, but it was not a situation where that that program was progressing at all. Um, but yeah, they they haven't done a good job hiring coaches. But you know, Alabama was really bad at hiring coaches for a long oh, yeah. stretch there too. And not that Nebraska is ever going to turn into what Alabama is now, uh, but you can become relevant with one good coaching hire. I mean, Kansas became relevant with one good coaching hire. You know, like any as I mentioned, Wake Forest before Wake Forest became relevant with one good coaching hire. It doesn't take that much to turn things around in college football, especially the way the transfer portal is now. You can turn over your roster super fast. Um, so, yeah, I think Nebraska can be relevant. I think they can be good. I think they're a long way away from competing for national titles. That's not a that's not a hot take. That's just, I mean, they're a long <laughs> way away. I don't think they're that far away from making a Big Ten championship game. So are they going to get blown out by Ohio State once they get there? Probably. But making a Big Ten championship game, I think, should be the next kind of after making bowl games and having winning records. That should be the next goal on the list, because once you're in that conversation of, hey, let's say we make a Big Ten championship game once every three years, right? Somewhere once every three, four years, somewhere in that neighborhood. Right. That's when you can kind of start to build momentum and maybe start reaching for for higher uh for higher aspirations than that because once you're in the big 10 championship game especially once the playoff gonna gets reformatted in a couple years here you're in the conversation for a national title at that point yeah yeah you're at least in a 12 team playoff in that situation uh if you can get there i mean we saw michigan state make a playoff you know in the four team format exactly there's no washington washington made like cincinnati made a playoff like there these are these are achievable goals and I think we're going to start to look at the college football playoff a little bit more the way we do the NCAA basketball tournament, where, you know, if you make a final four, like that's kind of like a national championship to some, like it, for some pro or even like a sweet 16 for some program. Yeah. Like I, I cover Creighton a ton here in Omaha, like making yeah. a sweet 16 was a huge deal for Creighton. You know, if they made a final four, that would be an enormous deal. It would be as big of a deal almost as winning a national championship. Cause you know, once you get to that final level, it's sort of a coin flip and it, you know, you kind of understand where you are as a program. It's like when, you know, when uh, VCU or George Mason makes a final four, that's a national championship to them. Like that's as big, like that's as big as it gets. Right. Yes. And so uh, I think people are going to start to view a little bit, not quite to the same extent, the college football playoff the same way where if a Cincinnati or a central Florida or a coastal Carolina makes a college football playoff, that's going to, you're going to hang a banner for that. You know, it's not just, we have to win the national championship for any of this to mean anything. Once you kind of make that playoff or you make the semifinals of that playoff, then that's a big deal. And you get to have pride in that. And Nebraska needs to start taking steps to where that's even possible. Cause right now it's not, it's not and even close. No, not we're not even, even in the, we're not even the stratosphere. Right. But I think they're closer to taking those steps if they find the right coach because they're not that far from an Iowa. Iowa was like, what, one snap away from a college football oh, yeah. playoff, basically, a handful of years ago. Um, Wisconsin has been kind of knocking on that door a little bit. Obviously, they haven't broken through, but they're kind of in that same neighborhood where if they kind of catch lightning in a bottle one year, that could happen. In 2017. 
Uh, they were yeah. right there. If they had won the, I mean, they lost what twenty six to twenty to Ohio State in the in the Big Ten title game. Yeah, and exactly. They were undefeated. Right. So those are there. If you can be in that position, which there's no reason at all Nebraska can't be in the same position as Iowa or Wisconsin, and I think that should be the goal. And it feels like they're really far away from that. But how about it this? Let's move into the coaching. Let, let's move into the coaching aspect of this. Uh, yeah. What kind of a coach could win in Lincoln? Right. It, you know. I'm looking at your list now that I uh, that I talked about before. You know, you've got for make them say no. You've got Aranda, Kiffin, Whittingham, and Peterson, um, good and gettable. Campbell, O'Brien, and Kleinman. Uh, you know, what what guy is maybe best suited for this job? To me, like I've got three names on here. I've got Stoops, Leipold, and Munkin, and that's mainly to just build that foundation back, mm-hmm. build the culture back. Uh, those aren't guys that are gonna just recruit gangbusters, right? And, and Stoops right. has proven he's really good at, at recruiting. Um, but somebody like Mark Stoops, who the SEC East is starting to build up a little more. You're seeing yeah. Tennessee and South Carolina do bigger things. Kentucky took advantage of a down SEC East. Right. Uh, with the change in realignment with Oklahoma and Texas coming in, you know, Kentucky will still be down there. Now, he's got a fantastic contract. But as we've yeah. seen, like Nebraska's in the Big Ten, the money is going to be equal if not better uh but the expectations might be different that might be a little bit different situation who do you think best fits what would work at nebraska yeah so stoops is a good name he wasn't on my original list um i would take stoops in a heartbeat i do think it's going to be a little harder to pry him away from kentucky than some people think seem to think um they are doing a lot of things to try and keep him there you mentioned he's making almost seven million dollars a year um at kentucky the big thing for me with with Stoops is, does he want to be at a football first school? Because Kentucky's never going to be that. Kentucky's basketball till oh, yeah. the day it dies. Like that, and, and they've been fighting about that back and forth, right? Yeah, but, and you, you wonder yeah. some guys care about that more than others. They do, and, yeah. and I don't know how much he cares about that, or if he can just, you know, some people like that. You can kind of fly under the radar. And, oh yeah, and it allowed him time to build his program. It did, yeah. So uh, Stoops would be a good hire. Honestly, my favorite name on the list, and I don't think he's ever leaving Utah. But Kyle Whittingham is like that template of guy kills it on the offensive and defensive line and has a culture in place, has shown that he can slowly improve his recruiting um, as he builds successful teams. But he's got an identity. He knows who he is. The thing for me that's been neglected the most at Nebraska is. You know, they thought the quarterback could fix it or they thought a new offensive coordinator could fix it. They haven't had good line play in a very long time on either side of the ball. The defense has been a little better than the offense. But Nebraska, even under Callahan, was putting consistently offensive linemen in the NFL. Now, under Callahan, they were way better in the NFL than they were in college. So that was a different issue. But you have to be able, especially at a place like Nebraska, you have to start on the line of scrimmage. Um, but heck, even that's where Alabama started before they oh, started yeah. getting the five star receivers and the quarterbacks and everything. They won national titles because they dominated the line of scrimmage. I'm not saying Nebraska is going to do that. I mean, but that's Georgia where you just did it last year. <laughs> exactly. That's where you have to start, though, for me. And so they've focused. I think Nebraska's focused a lot on other things in the last few coaching hires. And to me, it's got to be about somebody that has a proven record of. A, implementing a culture, and B, developing line play in a way that is is sustainable. Because, listen, you may not always have a great quarterback. You may not always have a first-round quarterback. If you get your system going, you can get consistently all-conference-level line play year in and year out. We've seen it at Iowa. We've seen it at Wisconsin. These are things that are that are doable. You know um, who, you're, who you're describing right now is uh, Lance Leipold. So I, I, I like Lance Leipold. Play. He's yeah. got Nebraska ties, which I think people around here like a lot. Um, how, how about this? Tell me this. Would would Nebraska fans be okay with hiring a coach from Kansas if he's coming off of, you know, a four and eight season or something along those lines? So that's the big issue is obviously he went two and 10 last year. Doesn't have a huge track record at Kansas. I think he's got to have a winning record this year to even be in the conversation. Um, he checks a lot of the boxes. He really does. But the fact of the matter is Nebraska can't really take a risk on this hire. Um, I don't think that's why I like Jeff Monken a lot. I don't think he gets a 
good look because a too many people are afraid that he'll run strict chip triple option and b too many people are afraid that his success at army won't translate um and i understand both of those i do uh yeah. if you're in a better position as a program you can make a little bit of a risky hire um that's why i really like jamie chadwell out of coastal carolina because oh, yeah. i think he runs an offense similar to what we would see from monken at a bigger school uh but Jamie but it's Chadwell's a different a little... type of it's like a spread option, right? It's yes. it's, it's yeah. really weird uh, marriage of the spread mixed with that triple option, and uh, what he has done at Coastal is awesome. I I had him on the show last year, and he is so much fun. He's insanely like, he, obviously he'll win the press conference. Yeah, but you're not worried about winning the press conference, right? Like we we've right. got to get somebody, and he understands line play. I mean, you saw it against Army last week. He does. Yeah, uh, he he knows that that is where it starts, and you can almost fit anybody that comes up in his program into one of those slots, and they will be successful. Like it's he, he would be great, and that's why I like him so much. I think for where Nebraska's at, it's probably a little bit higher risk profile than they want to take at this point. They probably want someone that has some power five experience either as an assistant or as a head coach or, or something like that. Um, but I love Jamie Chadwell. He reminds me a lot kind of of what Gus Malzahn did when at his early days in Auburn when he had quarterbacks that weren't quite as pass proficient. And so they did a ton of motion, a ton of different looks into triple option type spread looks and things like that. But um, the guy that I think is most likely Nebraska ends up with Kyle Whittingham is my, my wish list. But the guy that I think is most likely, and I, I think everybody would be happy with it, is Matt Campbell. Um, he's got a background in offensive line. Uh, he came up as an offensive line coach. Um, obviously, he's had uh, success at Iowa State, which is a really difficult place to win, as we've seen uh, over the course of forever. Um, but Matt Campbell, I think, would both win the press conference. He'd be he'd be acceptable for Nebraska fans, and I think he's a good hire. Um, yeah. So to me, that's probably the guy that is most likely. And I think he's kind of seen that maybe there's a ceiling at, at Iowa state. Um, and that would, I think, open the door for um, him to come to Nebraska. And there's been, listen, there are rumors, but there's rumors that he's open to it. Um, That's, so, I, I've heard the same. I've heard the same. So. Yeah. <laughs> I, I don't think it's, I don't think it's totally smoke and mirrors. I think there's something there in the fact that that's why he was in the gettable category because I do think he is gettable. Obviously, Nebraska is going to pay him more than Iowa State does. Obviously, Nebraska has got more resources than Iowa State does. And you've got the conference certainty. Who knows what the Big 12 looks like four years exactly. from now? You know, and we know what the Big 10, we know the Big 10 is going to be here. We don't know how many teams it's going to have. We don't know how many, you know, what divisions are going to be like, but we know it'll be one of the two major players in college football. And that, to me, is an opportunity that a lot of coaches would be interested in if they're not in it right now. Now you have certainly got that right. All right, I have kept you long enough. I certainly appreciate you being here. For anybody that wants to follow him, go follow Ravi at R-A-L-U-L-L-A on Twitter. And, of course, it'll be in the description, so you guys can go and click that link right there. But, Ravi, I got to tell you, uh, I certainly appreciate you joining. Absolutely. Thanks for having me on. Of course. All right, we appreciate Ravi for joining us. Of course, again, check him out on Twitter, at R-A-L-U-L-L-A. Uh, fantastic interview. Love to know what all's going on in the state of Nebraska, what they are expecting out of Scott Frost, what they're expecting out of uh, out of the Cornhuskers. I mean, just uh, crazy stuff going on over there. All right, you guys have been fantastic. Uh, just uh, continuing to support the show in record numbers over and over and over again. I can't thank you enough. Can't thank you enough. Continue to hit that subscribe button if you've not already. <laughs> Make sure that you hit the like button for us as well. Jump into the Winning Cures Everything Picks contest. Of course, that's over at winningcureseverything.com. And make sure that you sign up over at US. Of course, they present the show. They are a presenting sponsor. They are America's premier online sports book. And it's where the game begins. So, very easy to do. Go check us out over on the BetUS College Football Show. Uh, I went over the Under the Radar games, but we hit on a ton of them. I believe that's 12 games here. I believe we hit, uh, let's see. 15 games over there, so 27 total games that, that we've talked about this week total. Uh, really good stuff over there. So go ahead and subscribe. Thank you again for getting us over 6,000 subscribers over there. And uh, and we are shooting for over 7,500 over here on the Winning Cures Everything channel. Again, you guys are fantastic. Take care of yourself. Take care of each other. And hopefully, hopefully, all of you tickets cash this weekend. Mm-hmm.
Thanks for listening to Winning Cures Everything. Make sure and subscribe on YouTube or your favorite podcast app. And make sure to leave a nice five-star review. You can follow Gary on Twitter, at GaryWCE. And the show is at Winning Cures. Be sure to check out the merch in our web store and share the show.